The following video is part 11 of a 12-part series of videos recalling some of the most significant paleontological discoveries of the last year. The previous video in the series was from Benji Thomas, so I suggest checking that out first. A full compilation of all 12 videos will be uploaded on January 1st to the EDGE channel, so keep a lookout for that as well. So November was host to a number of significant publications. There were some strange new faces, some reanalysis of known taxa, and a few other surprises along the way. To bring some sort of order to this mess, I'm going to be going through the discoveries in roughly chronological order of when these animals lived. So we start way back in the early Cambrian. Yes, that's right, I'm going to be talking about Cambrian worms. But not those Cambrian worms, I'm afraid. Instead, a species known as a Cosmia mautiania. The Wikipedia page for this species has two short sentences and identifies it as a Priapulid, but a new study by Howard et al. redescribes it as a stem Ecdysozoan. Ecdysozoa is the superphylum that contains arthropods, nematodes, and Priapulids, and various other creatures, including many of the Cambrian's weirdest fauna. The basal position of this species offers insight into how the Ecdysozoans evolved. While a Cosmia has a mouth, it lacks the characteristic pharyngeal armature, that is, the weird mouth part of the crown Ecdysozoans. This suggests that this structure gave the group a competitive advantage in predation that may have fueled the explosion of diversity in the Cambrian. Staying in the Cambrian, in fact in the same formation, we find an even more bizarre creature. Imagine an Opabinia crossed with an Anomalocaris. Well that's basically Klingshiazangi, with its five eyes and Anomalocaris-like front appendages. Klingshia is thought to represent another step in the story of arthropod evolution, in this case fitting between the radiodonts, the family that Anomalocaris belongs to, and the deuteropods, which includes arthropods. It suggests that the raptorial appendages of the radiodonts might actually be basal to the clade, and that they are homologous with features in a number of other groups, including the mouthparts of arachnids and horseshoe crabs. Moving forward in time from the bizarre world of the Cambrian invertebrates, it's time to talk about some dinosaurs, particularly sauropods. In 2016, the first ever carnivorous sauropodomorph, Borealestes schultzi, was described. A new study from Müller et al. examined the brain case of the animal. The flocular lobe was enlarged, while the olfactory bulb was small, implying that the animal hunted by sight rather than smell. The brain was also larger in proportion to the animal than those of later sauropods, which is somewhat surprising. You see, the anthropocentric view of evolution generally posits that animals evolve in the direction of larger brains and greater intelligence, but it appears that sauropods completely buck the trend. It turns out you don't need big brains to hunt leaves. Another stride in the understanding of sauropod evolution came in the form of Baguilia alba. Discovered in Argentina, this species represents the oldest member of the group known as Eusauropoda. For much of the early Jurassic, sauropodomorphs were a diverse group, with everything from small bipedal anchiosaurs to gigantic quadrupedal lesemsaurids. However, by the Middle Jurassic, Eusauropods had all but taken over as the dominant group of sauropod. Paul et al. suggests that this was the result of climate change caused by volcanic activity, which would have reduced floral diversity, leading to a dominance of conifers. Eusauropods such as Bagualia were well adapted to this tough vegetation, with its robust jaws, long neck, and large gut capacity. The smaller, weaker-jawed prosauropods were unable to adapt to this environment, so went extinct. Moving ahead to the Cretaceous, I'm afraid we have an Amber Alert. <coughs> yes, it's another fossil skull encased in Amber, although at least this one was obtained following the SVP ethical guidelines. The fossil is of a new species of albinopetontid amphibian named Yaksha Peretti. The albinopetontids were a group of salamander-like animals which existed from at least the mid-Jurassic and became extinct around the beginning of the Pleistocene, which means we very narrowly missed out on meeting them. This new fossil preserves the soft tissue of the animal, including parts of the mouth and tongue, which look eerily similar to those of chameleons. This suggests that the animals were ballistic feeders, using their tongues to capture small prey. This is a fascinating insight into a group we know so little about. Yaksha isn't the only dead ringer for a modern species published in November. At first glance, this bird might look like a South American toucan, but it is in fact from Lake Cretaceous Madagascar. Its name is Falcatakelli fosteri. Currently known only from a skull, we cannot be sure of its exact phylogenetic placement, although O'Connor et al. suggests that it might belong to the Eantiornithians, the most abundant group of birds in the Cretaceous. Another discovery from Africa is Ajnabia radiceus. Hailing from Morocco, this is the first hadrosaur discovered in Africa. It is thought to be related to similar species from Europe, belonging to the newly named Arenosaurinae. 
but as Africa was an island in the late Cretaceous, the hadrosaurs must have somehow crossed the ocean between the continents, hence the species name Odysseus. Moving across to North America, we have a rather unimpressive Ceratopsian premaxilla fossil. However, even this small bone has an interesting story to tell. If you've watched the previous videos in this series, you will have heard Spencer from Cretaceous Cast talk about Stellosaurus, and Stephen from Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong talk about Terminocavus and Navajo Ceratops. Therefore, you might be familiar with the concept of anagenesis, where fossils of different ages form what appears to be an evolutionary chain. This new premaxilla is from the very oldest beds in Hell Creek. It appears to have a morphology intermediate between that of the Canadian Eotriceratops and Triceratops itself, potentially suggesting a line of descent and furthering our understanding of how they evolved. Now from a rather unremarkable Hell Creek fossil to perhaps one of the most impressive. You may already be familiar with the dueling dinosaurs, the fossil of a Triceratops and a Tyrannosaur preserved together. After much concern that the specimens would remain in private hands, they have finally been obtained by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and will now be studied over the coming years. There is much to learn from this fossil. Were the two dinosaurs locked in combat when they died, or did their bodies come to rest near each other by coincidence? What was the identity of the Tyrannosaur, a juvenile T-Rex, or another species entirely? These and many more questions will hopefully be answered in due time. And in the meantime, shut up about Nano Tyrannus. The final discovery I want to talk about is much more recent, around 12,000 years old, but perhaps the most spectacular of the discoveries in this video. Last year, rock shelters in Colombia were rediscovered by archaeologists, which were inhabited by some of the earliest peoples of the Amazon. The sites contain a multitude of human artifacts, as well as floral and faunal remains. Most impressive of all were the paintings that adorned the walls of these shelters, featuring depictions of numerous megafaunal species, including what might be mastodons, horses, and ground sloths. Of note is a three-toed, long-necked, long-trunked creature, which could represent an animal like Macrochenia or Xenorhinotherium. This find is also significant because many of these animals are savanna species, which would have been ill-suited to the rainforest that exists in the area today, suggesting drastic changes in the environment since the end of the Ice Age. And so that concludes my review of November. The final video in this series will be presented by Trey the Explainer and hosted on the Edge channel, so once again be sure to subscribe and keep an eye out for the next video and the full compilation.